Uh, thank you, everyone, for inviting me here. Thank you, Mike, for giving me credit for the millennial generation. I did give birth to several of them. Um, and I think Morley and I would like to think that the reinventing government movement may have had something to do with their ideas, but since uh, Chloe was a third grader during reinventing government, I'm not quite sure I can go that far, but if you say so, we're responsible. Um, and uh, thank you, everybody, for having me. I would like to talk a little bit about climate change and domestic American politics. And the reason those two things are put together in the same program is because, as in all major policy initiatives, it is ultimately the politics that determine the resulting shape of the initiative. And so let me start a little bit with the project that Rob Shapiro and I are just getting started on, the Climate Change Task Force. Uh, as you look at the last couple of years, you realize that a pretty amazing thing has happened, that Al Gore in his um, retirement from politics has managed to have perhaps more impact on the political scene than he did when he was in the government, practically. And he has single-handedly managed to put climate change on the policy agenda. And so we see now a steady drumbeat of news about climate change. Television has really gotten onto this story, so they're, they're connecting it to weather events, which is, which is appropriate. They're connecting it to perhaps things that are not appropriate. But basically, this is now a clear major domestic policy agenda item for the next administration. Uh, obviously, chances are if it's a Democrat, it'll be given more attention than if it's a Republican, but I even think in a McCain presidency, we'll see attention to climate change. Now, the interesting thing about this is for the last 20 years, climate change was never taken seriously politically. It just simply wasn't going to happen. In point of fact, uh, because the US Congress kept turning down Kyoto, it was just kind of a non-starter. It was something the environmentalists talked about. It was something Al Gore, with, with a stick to that is that amazes me to this day, kept, kept on about. But the bottom line was that climate change was not something that serious public policy experts spent some time looking at. And in the course of this, kind of two different models developed for how to do climate change. One was a cap and trade system, and the other was a carbon tax system. And the interesting thing about this is that the cap and trade system grew out of, not of its intrinsic worth as a policy solution, it grew out of a political judgment. And the political judgment was that cap and trade is not a tax, and it would hide the fact that this was really a tax, and therefore, in an anti-tax era, we could go ahead and, and call it cap and trade and develop this system, and this would be the solution to climate change. Now, that was a kind, this is reflected, by the way, in paper after paper by economists. What almost all the economists who've looked at this say is, gee, first of all, cap and trade sort of is a tax. Secondly, it's very complex. And thirdly, a carbon tax is simply the more straightforward and maximally efficient way to do this. And then the economists say, but, but it's politically not viable. Well, the whole topic was politically not viable until the last 24 months, until Al Gore got the Nobel Prize for this. This was not politically viable. And so now we are really at the beginning of the serious policy discussion. Because the serious policy discussion doesn't make political judgments ahead of a political campaign. 
A serious policy discussion strives to find what's the best answer to this, and then how do we do the politics to make this happen? We're just, as I say, Rob and I are just beginning to put together the Climate Change Task Force. We intend to create as bipartisan a task force as we can for the purpose of trying to work through simultaneously the policy and the politics of a real climate change agenda. Right now, the policies are being worked out places and judgments are being made about the politics. But in fact, as we all know, when something big happens, it's because the two are working in tandem and together. In, in light of that, in a couple of weeks, uh, Rob is going to publish a paper, which will be probably the first of hopefully several papers out of this task force, where he proposes an idea that in fact has its genesis in the Clinton administration. And let me talk about this. It's a very clever way to do difficult policy. Bill Clinton wanted to put 100,000 new cops on the street. Remember that? Big campaign pledge from his 1992 campaign. He also wanted to balance the budget. 100,000 cops costs a lot of money. Bill Clinton married 100,000 cops on the streets of this America's cities with 100,000 bureaucrats out of the federal government. He took something the people wanted, something the people were not crazy about, put them together, and he had a policy that worked, that got funded, that went through Congress, and a lot of people give it a lot of credit for beginning the crime drop that we saw in the 1990s. Rob has obviously taken a political page out of that thinking, and he in this paper will show the feasibility of marrying a carbon tax with a cut in payroll taxes. Payroll taxes have been a big bugaboo of a lot of people in the United States because they are so regressive. Um, they're capped, obviously, so billionaires don't pay payroll taxes on, you know, 199.99999 millions of their dollars, and um, most ordinary people pay way too much in payroll taxes. So you will see in this paper the marriage of these two ideas. The interesting thing about this, and I hope that this will be only the first of these to come out of this task force, the interesting thing about this idea is that it takes an unpopular item and t marries it with a popular item. And Rob, of course, is, uh, has worked out all the numbers and shows how you could implement this, how it would work, and how you could still keep the government going. So that's the first of what we hope will happen in this climate task force. The important thing to do is to marry it with the reality of American domestic politics. And that's where we stand today. I know that today, most of the time when I'm asked to talk about American politics, I'm asked to talk about the fact that I am a superdelegate. And uh, this, has been, this, has been, this has been one of the more minor parts of my very, very 20-year-old plus doctoral dissertation was on superdelegates. It's certainly not been a big factor in my life. And these days, I talk about this every day. It's really been, it's really just kind of gotten kind of ridiculous. But if we look forward, and I want to look forward into a next administration, we can see that there's the overriding domestic policy issue is going to be around climate change and energy. And the reason is that just as in this administration, 9-11 forced the government to break down the walls between domestic policy and foreign policy in the creation of the Department of Homeland Security, in the next administration, we will have to break down the walls between domestic policy and foreign policy because Americans are finally ready. They all understand, the voters on the street will tell you that it is about time that we started to be energy independent, that we're sick and tired of going to war in the Middle East. 
And so the, the, the time has come for a real revolution in politics. We hope to make a con contribution to that in the next year by really working both the policy and the politics of climate change issues. But I think in the bigger energy field, and there's people, there are people uh, more, uh, more erudite than I going to follow me and talk about energy. In the whole energy field, America is really ready to listen. And we should go into this debate without any preconceptions about what is politically viable or not, because we are in fact facing a brand new political opportunity here, one that we haven't faced before. So that's where I hope we move. Let me say one final word, which is about a book I've written called The End of Government as We Know It. And in that book, I also project into the future and I predict that the 21st century will be the post-bureaucratic century. That in the next century, we will begin to do government differently than we have in the past. And I talk about three models. The third one is particularly relevant to this question of climate change. I talk about reinvented government, which Morley and I worked a lot on in the US federal government. Um, which is really bringing the best business techniques and the best information technology to government. I talk about government by network, which is where the government decides to implement policy through a series of non-governmental organizations. And I talk about government by market. And government by market is where the government makes a decision to create a market where none existed before usually through a very straightforward mechanism, a tax, basically through what the economists call externalities. Where did this start? Well, let me look at this water bottle. In 1970 in Oregon, they had a problem. The problem was people were throwing their beer cans and their Coke cans and their water bottles out of their cars and littering the highways. The state of Oregon had a couple options for solving the problem. They could have created the Oregon Department of Clean Highways. They could have hired civil servants to pick up the bottles and the cans and had built a building and put the civil servants in and had them show up at 8 and go out at 8.30 every morning and pick up bottles. They could have created a governmental, governmentally funded network. They could have gone out. They could have hired NGOs and private companies to go pick up the highways. Instead, they adopted what, in retrospect, of course, is the most straightforward and simple policy. They said, we're going to use our government power to require a five cent tax on every bottle that's sold. And then guess what? When you return the bottle, you can get the money back. 35, 37 states in the United States now have bottle laws, uh, bottle bills of one form or another. The highways are, in fact, cleaner than they were in the 70s. And nobody would think of trying to do this in a different way. As we look forward to the next administration, and as we look forward to the challenge of climate change, we realize that this will be the situation of the bottle bill, but on steroids. We will have to change the behavior of millions of people. We will have to change fundamental incentives in the way Americans live and what they do. We cannot do that by building a bureaucracy. There will be no Department of Climate Change out here on Pennsylvania Avenue with 50,000 or so civil servants reporting hierarchically. What there will be are a series of complex state-created markets trying to shape behavior on the part of individuals, behavior on the part of industries, behavior on the part of businesses in ways that will get to the climate change and the ind energy independence goals. That involves not just new policy, but what we haven't really focused on is that the climate change challenge involves new methods of impl implementing policy. The 20th century bureaucracy will simply not work for this challenge as it has not worked for 
many other challenges that we're going to face. Uh, that's why uh, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about climate change and American domestic politics. Um, I do not know who's going to win the presidential nomination on the Democratic side. Um, I don't know who's going to win the election. I do know that though whoever is president is going to face an unprecedented challenge when it comes to this issue because it crosses so many boundaries and requires so much creativity.